Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Avalon History Center virtual program. I think we have a really great program for you. My name is Bill Mengel, and I'm the interpreter here at the museum. For those that you uh, are just registering with us for the first time, welcome and thank you very much. For you, those who are familiar with and are coming back again, welcome back. Glad to have you back. Um, we are at 215 39th Street between Ocean and Dune. Our hours of operation, even with the COVID now, are now 10 to 4, Monday through Friday. And on Saturday, we're here from uh, 10 to 1. So as I said, I think we've got a great program for you today. Uh, we have, it's the High in the Highfield families. It's a family that uh, actually has been in Cape May County since the 1860s, but um, actually they were one of the first families in Avalon. So that's what makes this thing so interesting. And I had the pleasure of previewing some of the photographs and talking with the presenter here we have today. And I'll tell you, there's some fantastic photographs here. And I think you're gonna find it very interesting. Our presenter today is Bruce Tell. He's a local historian. He's very familiar with Avalon and Stone Harbor. He's actually done uh, tours at the Cape May uh, Lighthouse in Cape May a couple of years ago. He actually, if, if, if any of you attended it, he did the Avalon walking tour, which had, we had an excellent results with. So Bruce is very familiar with the history of Avalon. And before I turn it over to him, I just wanted to say that if anybody should have any questions out there, during the presentation, we'll, we'll probably take those questions at the end. There is a Q&A section uh, for those, again, who are here for the first time at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that with your cursor and then put in your question, and then we'll address the questions at the very end of the program. So I think that's about it for me from here, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bruce Tell now. So everybody, hopefully, enjoy. Thank you. Bruce, it's all yours. All right. Greetings, everybody. Now, do I have to put up the? Just saying, thanks for Thank you for everybody. I want to thank Bill Mangle and Bonita Risley for their invaluable help with this program. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Mr. Robert Penrose for his incredible book. It's an encyclopedia on Seven Mile Island. Last night, just looking up to double check something in the book, I found up a whole lot more of information. So. There's, it, it's an incredible book, and I guess we're ready to go now. Okay, so this is what the what this program is going to be. Uh, Highfield families and their some local friends of theirs on uh, Seven Mile Island. Um, I was also I came up with the name kind of dedicated to Bob Dylan because he used to have a road radio program called Friends and Neighbors, and I thought it was appropriate for this. So. Well, just a little brief history of Seven Mile Island. This is a brief history. The, the, the full story, go on to the Avalon History Center. It's three part series. The first part is by Bill about uh, the early years of the, of the island. I'm gonna just, like I said, a little brief thing and not go too much for the full detail. Click on to uh, Bill's uh, story of the early years. It was originally Seven Mile Island. Basically it was a deserted island, seven miles long. It was bought by Frank Siddle and Joseph Wells from Philadelphia in 1888 to, uh, with the plans of developing it into the communities, which amazingly it turned into just what they had planned it to be. When they bought, before they bought the island, there was approximately five buildings on the whole island. Uh, a life-saving station was about 80th Street. The Aaron Leeming Homestead, known as Old Limerick, was built around 1780 near 31st Street and the Tatum Farmhouse built there in 1856 near 22nd Street. A couple other outbuildings or whatever might have been on the island, but it was just basically a deserted island. Massive sand dunes, the highest dunes in the whole county, 50, 60 feet high, with a forest behind them, with marshes and creeks and ponds all behind that. So the uh, Frank Siddle and Joseph Wells bought the island, and then they, they, they bought it to develop it in the communities. Uh, the, the, uh, for their land sales, uh, the, that they, uh, when they sold pieces of the island, the first was Avalon by the sea. That was the north end of the island, south to 25th Street. The next section was Piermont, 25th Street to 42nd Street. The third section was Stone Harbor, 
80th Street to the south end of the island. And in between that, from 42nd Street to 80th Street, was called Holiday Beach. And that was basically just open land. The street layout, they, they laid out, because this was a real estate adventure for them. They laid out all, they plotted all the streets and the, and the, and the lots on, a, on, on a right angles, a rectangular blocks. All the uh, avenues ran from the uh, north end of the island to the south end of the island. And the streets, numbered streets ran from east to west. Uh, starting at the north end of the island. The street layouts were square blocks, well, actually rectangular, the same as Philadelphia or New York City. Um, so they bought the island of, of the plans of developing it. And builders and contractors arrived to the island from Cape May, basically. There was a huge fire in Cape May City in 1878 that burned, burned about 40 acres. So for the next 10 years, there was a building boom in Cape May which led to the call of hiring many builders. And because of that era, this is why Cape May is a Victorian. All the buildings and houses that were built were of the Victorian style. 10 years later, when Seven Mile Island opened up, many of the workers moved up to the new, the new island. Okay, here we go. Now, these pictures, a lot of these pictures were donated by Joan Snyder Peterson of her family. This was one of the pictures that she uh, donated. This really had nothing to do with the High or the Highfield family, but because she included it, and I really like the fact that this shows what basically what Avalon looked like back at the turn of the century. This is the life-saving station. This is 15th Street here in front of us, and this would be First Avenue right here. You still have some sand dune here that hasn't been cleared away yet. You hear you have a tree lock because there was a forest. This was the life-saving station at the top end of the island, built in 1894. And there I lost, but there's the person. Now this fence here went all the way around in the back. This was a corral for the horses that the Coast Guard used during World War II. So the Coast Guard patrolled the island beaches on horseback, and the ocean and the beaches over here. And this is a week showing what the neighborhood looks like now. Here's the old, the modern houses of all of Avalon down here. And right here on the corner is a holdout from, say, the 50s or 60s. These houses are really unique to still see standing in the town. I think that's kind of neat. And, and now the life-saving station is a private residence. Here's the family tree. It started with uh, Malachi High, and he married Sarah Boker. They lived in Goshen, New Jersey, which was more along the bay side. They had a daughter, Emma, and there's the reason that this is Emma is in blue, Edna's in blue, Marion and Joan is because the next slide is going to show the four of them in a group photo. And again, Joan Snyder is the one that donated a lot of these pictures. So Malachi married Sarah Boker, and they moved, they moved to uh, um, Avalon, the Seven Mile Island, to, to start building. Their daughter, Emma, was born in Goshen during the Civil War. Uh, later, while living in Philadelphia with her sister, she met Amos Highfield. So Emma High became Emma Highfield. They moved to Avalon in 1891, staying with their parents, who had a house on, a, on 8th Avenue and the, the Marsh side, the Bay side. Uh, they weren't moved here because of work opportunities. Malachi, Malachi was a builder and helped build the Avalon Hotel and the first schoolhouse. Also just found out last night from Bob Penrose's book, excellent book, he became the dog catcher. He, he was in charge of the, the pound. So if there weren't many people on the island. The population was 180 to 200 people living scattered around on the island. There wasn't many a lot of people there yet. So anybody there got recruited to be part of a job, do something on the island. Um, Amos and Emma had a daughter, Edna, who she was born in Goshen in 1890. And she married Eck Colburn. He was, a, he was a photographer and had a penny postcard business. Um, their marriage was I, don't want, I won't go into too much of the gossip, but their marriage was troubled, and they divorced, 
And then she married uh, Frank Furtek, and he became, he was a painter living on the island. So Edna married X, and they had a daughter, Marion Colburn. We're going to see the house she was born in a little later on, and she married Mr. Snyder. And then they had a daughter, Joan Snyder Peterson. And Joan is the little is the lady that brought in a lot of these pictures. They also had a son, Herbert Highfield. He was the first boy born in Avalon. He has the distinction of being the first baby on the island born there. He married Anna Fithian, and they had four children, one boy and three daughters. And one of their daughters married local resident Bill Buck. So that's you don't have to take notes on any of this stuff to the very last slide you'll be required because there's going to be a lot of names and, and a lot of conflicting information. On, I get most of my information from the back of the pictures. Okay, that's that. Next. Here's the group photo. Here's Emma Highfield. Here's her daughter, Edna. Here's her daughter, Marion. And then here's Joan, the one that supplied a lot of the pictures. Um, let's see, so this is great grandma, grandma, mom, and daughter. And notice, never smiles. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later also. But there's a group photo of them. Now, probably this photo was taken by uh, Eck with his photography business. But when you're living in a town with uh, 180 other people, how busy is business going to be for you? So that might have been part of his problem that he was pr under pressure and not doing well. And We'll leave it at that. Okay, now we're going to move to A Street, where the highs, the highs house was. This is Beach Creek. And now this, again, thanks to Mr. Penrose, these names didn't mean very much. Marts and this one, I have to thank this man for having a name that I can't really pronounce. Von Bainenberg's Boathouses on A Street. This is the Marts Boathouse, and this is the Von Bainenberg. Just learned yesterday that he ended up becoming on the town council, and he was a he was a, a big part of what went on in the town. Also, looking at this picture, and I never knew until last night, right here is the Leeming Hotel, which is at the top end of the north end of the island. And this was a and I lost this was a hotel original hotel built. Over here, right here, this A frame is the swing bridge on the train trestle. The only way you got to come into Avalon was by train, either that by boat or you swam. And speaking of boats, keep an eye on this boat. We're going to see this again in a little while. So this is Beach Creek, which in a few years will be dredged out, and this will be the Cornell Harbor. And this will be uh, 7th Street right back here. The high house on A Street and the creek. Not sure who the two men are. There's no name on the back, and just imagine. And the photo's by Eck Colburn, because he was a photographer and trying to get a business going. And note the, note the paved roads. Now, here's, here's uh, Malachi's wife, Sarah, Sarah Boker High, on the porch of their house, the A Street in the Creek. Later on, the Stickney family moved into this house. And again, there were so few people on the island. Everybody was friends with everybody, knew each other. And so that's what their house looked like. There's now condos there. This is the high house with a watercolor done by uh, famous artist Ray Ellis. Ray Ellis lived in Avalon for about 20 years uh, over by the beach, I think on 29th Street. And uh, he got to he painted around the town. Ray Ellis, we, came, we did a show on him at the Avalon a few 10, 15 years ago. He has about 15 books out. And one of the two of the books that he did was with a friend of his, Walter Cronkite. They sailed from Key West, Florida up to Maine. And uh, Walter Cronkite wrote the text. And Ray Ellis did the paintings for the uh, books. And uh, they were, did two volumes. So this was his picture. And that's the house. And that's the photo of the house. And that's his interpretation of it. Next, another local artist and famous man about town, or character about town, William Wallace Smith, Bill Smith. Now, when he painted the house, he was friends with the Stickneys, and the Stickneys were living in the house. And it was just recently, I didn't notice that he even included a little seagull down here. I hadn't noticed that. So that's Bill Smith's version of the, the house, which was now the Stickneys' house. 
Back to that boat. There's that boat again. Now, here's the gang. And again, don't need to take notes or keep a scorecard of who these people are. But Cedar Island in the background. This is the, the uh, creek, which will become Cornell Harbor. According to the picture, this is Sadie High in the dark dress and her daughter Blanche in front of her. Enough said, and you're ready to go on a little excursion. Now we're going to move up to 32nd Street in Piermont. This is um, right here. It says on the back of the picture, a school for the handicapped. X marks a building behind the Highfield store. This is the Weintraub's house. We're going to discuss that in a little bit. Next to that is the Highfield store, Beach Pavilion, and the Methodist Church. This house is still standing. It's built 1900. This is where Marion Snyder was born, behind the Highfield store. This is the Weintraub's house. This is, uh, again, 1900. This is 1890-91, and the Methodist Church is 1890-91. Now, the really neat thing, and here's the uh, Avalon Pier. Here's the boardwalk, which is in the ocean, and the boardwalk comes right to First Avenue. This is First Avenue here, and this is 32nd Street. This is now a street all the way down with houses on it, and this is another whole, this is Avalon Boulevard. So the boardwalk got moved back farther, and this is all beach. Joe Paterno's house was right over here on this side of the street. Um, one more thing. Yeah, that, and just the beach came right up almost to First, to first Avenue here. Picture of the Weintraub house with the boardwalk coming right up to the front of the house. And here's the whole gang. Now, the Weintraubs were three sisters. Um, that never married, they were spinsters. And I'm um, going to get into them in another picture or two, but just take it for granted. So the house is still standing there on 32nd Street. Right up here, there's a plaque that calls it Sandspur. And I just noticed last year, there's another historic plaque here claiming that the house was built in 1880, but that's wrong. It was built in 1891. There was, in 1880, like I said, there was five buildings at all, basically five buildings on the island. Now, the, the Louisa Weintraub, Sarah Louise was a doctor, but she also liked to fish. So she would just walk down the steps, walk down the boardwalk, go around the corner, and just fish off the pier. That was her big, that was her big thrill. And I believe that's her right there. And that's another sister. And that might be their mother there or something, but we'll, we'll see a little bit better. But the house is still there, and now there's a street in front of it. Here we're on the beach with their cousin, Howard High. He was a lifeguard from 1906 to the first year of 1915. And then he might've gone off to war. Here's the Methodist Church. Here's the Highfield store and the Weintraub house in the background. Here's, let's see, Sarah Louise. She was a physician. She was actually, I understand, a, I was told a brain surgeon. I think with the dark hair is Helen. She was a stay-at-home foster mom. And this is uh, Georgine. She was a Philly school teacher. And these are all the kids. Any pictures of, the, of these women, there's always kids. They, they were foster parents. They had kids. There would always be a puppy or two, a kitten. They always had a gang of kids. They never married. They were just, they were just an incredible family. Oh, uh, they were born in Damascus, Syria. Their parents were missionaries. They moved back to the Philly area around 1875. Sarah graduated from the Women's College of Pennsylvania in 1883, which I believe later became Drexel, part of Drexel University. She was the first woman to work in the Pennsylvania prison system with the post of resident physician. And I, well, what I was told, she was a brain surgeon. in front of their house with the uh, Highfield store in the background. It's a picture says Mr. Smith. Okay. Here's Mama Wine. Come on. Come on. Here's Mama Weintraub. And here's Dr. Sarah Louise. Big women. And I was told when she got her spot, she'd go around the corner because here's the Highfield store right here in the background. 
she'd go down to the end onto the boardwalk to go fishing and i was told if there were people in this, her spot she would just shake her hips a little and bounce them out of the way she's a big woman so i guess she's ready with her fishing equipment here here they are on their front porch with the uh, Highfield store in the background. Here's uh, Sarah Louise, Mama, Hi Mama Weintraub, uh, Georgianne, and Helen, I believe. And here's their famous hammock. The hammock is still here on the front porch. And there's the beach pavilion. So the beach is right back here. We're looking, looking east towards the beach. Now, Weintraub's in DC, this little sidebar. March 2nd, 1913, and we recognize this building from last month. This is the Capitol building, and there's one of the Weintraub sisters. Why are they there? They're there for the suffrage parade on March 3rd, 1913. This is their float, and this is them up on the float in, this, in their garb from their days in Syria. So they, uh, they put costumes on with their... And this is how they marched in the parade to suffer for women's rights. Really cool women, really cool. Now we're back to the store. There's the wine shop house in the background and the boardwalk. Here's Edna, Emma and Amos's daughter, Edna. And she was married at Colburn. They divorced and then she married Frank Furtek. And she's in front of their store, which had bathrobes to hire. And, uh, and, and whatever. Now, again, doesn't have a smile on her face. And notice these two barrels right here, because there's the two barrels with her dad now, Amos, Amos and his friend. So the store, besides bathrobes, sold tobacco and cigars, don't, don't sure what that is, and candies. And here's the wine Weintraub's house. And even right there is the hammock. So this picture is looking west down 32nd Street. Let's see. Okay, next picture. At first, when I saw this picture, I thought this was the Piermont train station, but I looked at it and checked it out. No, it's on the boardwalk, probably around 29th Street. This is probably where Tim Kerr wants to build his uh, restaurant and ice cream store and, and whatever else it is that he wants to build right on the beach. So this is the uh, Amos and Emma, and they're in their mid-40s in this picture, and their dog. So here's Edna and her husband, Eck, and their little daughter, Marion Snyder. And this is 1914. Again, that's not much of a smile. Eck was a bit of a, he was a good looking guy. And I, I again, rumors are a bit of a dandy and uh, you know, they didn't stay married, but it looks like this is a post photo in his studio, being that he was a photographer. Now, this is Lil. Let's go back. Her daughter Marion. Here's where Marion. Hey, here's where Marion was born. There's little Marion on the front porch. Nice, nice house in Avalon. Wooden boardwalk. Little wooden boardwalk here. This is the house right here where the X is. Behind the 32nd Street store. Now here's the family. These are 1883. She's 21 years old. Amos is 23. She's 21 years old. And here's their son, Herbert, the first boy born in Avalon. He too was a lifeguard, 1916, 1917. And then he got drafted and he went to the war. We'll see that a little bit later also. Um, I think I'm talking too fast. I'm going too fast through this. Okay, I'm going to back up one more. No, okay, never mind. Okay, here's a really favorite, favorite picture. Yeah, and again, what's this is what's written on the back of it. Here's Emma Highfield, sister Aunt Anna High. And she's got a couple of names. Mrs. Rocket, don't know anything about her, but she looks really interesting. And here's Edna. And again, with the, her famous smile. 
a little sidebar. We did a train ride about uh, 10 years ago, a steam locomotive train ride in Kentucky. And there was this older woman sitting by me, and she had these piercing blue eyes. And I think of her every time I see this picture. I eventually asked her if I could take her picture, which she was a little hesitant about. But she let me take her picture because she just was so dynamic. And then she told me her story. Her and her husband lived on a farm in North Alabama for 50 years. And then without hesitating, it almost killed me, is what she told me. Living on the farm, it almost killed me. And every time I see Edna's picture, I think about that lady because she it must have been just hard work for her, all, all work and no play. Not sure where this picture was taken, but again, there's a group photo of the family. Now this picture, again, I learned from an obituary. This says on the back of the picture, grand opening. And it's Emma Highfield, that's right, she's 80 years, 90 years old. She opened up a confectionery and yarn shop on 30th and, uh, and Dune Drive. It later became Sam's Market, Sam's Market, and this is daughter Edna's for tax house in the background. Now, a little later on, I, I did a write-up. There was a write-up about her on her hundred third when she was 103. It says the first store that the Highfields had was on A Street. Then they had a store in 1910 on Boardwalk and 32nd Street, next to the Wine Trobs. That was that was the bathhouse. Then in the 1930s, they had a store on the 21st Street, but only lasted for three years. Then in 1946, and this is key, they had a store on 30th and 2nd Avenue, which is Dune Drive, confectionery and wool store. And then in 1952, they moved back to 29th Street and the boardwalk, and she had a wool store. Well, this says 1952, and on the back it says grand opening. Now I'm thinking, and that's what the flowers I was told were for congratulating her on 90. But in 1952, they sold this. So maybe that's congratulations. We sold the store and they moved another store over to the boardwalk. So conflicting information. And this is what it looks like uh, last, last month. And where she's standing right here, I'm guessing is right next to this tree, or the step behind it. This is where she's standing in that photo. This is what it looks like today with Long and Foster real estate right there. So this is Dune Drive and this is 30th Street, the main street coming into Avalon now. Behind the, this was Edna's house. With it up at this point is for sale. And again, I'll go back to this picture. This is what's there now. Now we're going back to 8th Street. This is 3rd Avenue. This is 8th Street here. This is what typical houses of Avalon look like now. That's why I showed that first picture of the life saving station to show just how open and barren it was. E.B. High, as it says right there, was a contractor and a painter. Yeah, this was his paint shack on 8th and 3rd Avenue. Albert High was his name, and he was Emma's brother. And there's some of his paint cans here. This is 1907. Now, this is 8th, 8th Street again, 3rd Ave right here. There's his paint shack. is right there on the west side of 3rd Avenue. And again, this is the information on the back of the picture, so take my word for it or not. You don't have to. Hands on hips. Sadie Knight Pie. Others are Elmira, Walter, and Blanche. And on the porch is Aunt Emma. And this is the Dew Drop Inn right here. And note the windows on this house. This is what the corner looks like last year. The paint shop would have been right over here. There's now condos all across uh, Ocean Drive where their house would have been. This is Ocean Drive. The railroad came in right in through here on Ocean Drive. And uh, here's the Dew Drop Inn with Sadie Nye Pie on the front porch with little Elmira and Blanche High. Again, you have to take your word for it. Another one with 
the information on the back. Now here's that house again with the windows on it. Uncle Chris Dowling, Uncle Albert, the painter, driving with Blanche and Elmira in the back seat and Sadie Naipai all decked out here with their, with their vehicle. And here's the house with an upgrade on the vehicles in the front of it. And again, the typical Avalon house now. So a little difference. Here's the A Street house. Here's the Dew Drop Inn next door. And now we have the Stickneys in because small community, everybody knew everybody. So according to the picture, you have Ellen Stickney here. Uh, Blaine High, then you have Rebecca Stickney holding Little Virginia. Then up on the porch, Elmira, Sadie High holding Rebecca, Francis High, and Aunt Anna again. And again with the big smiles on their face. And I'm going way too fast. Walter High Jr. This is 8th Street looking uh, east in the front of their house. You notice the little bushes here. This is Herbert Highfield's house over here. Brick sidewalk and the ocean and the beach are down here looking east. And this is the neighborhood last year. The bushes have grown. They came, they moved them closer right to the sidewalk. The ocean and looking east this way. Not sure who Joe is, but take his word for it. This is Joe, Grandpa Knight. Again, these are the things that are relatives wrote on the back of the picture. So I went by it. Here's Walter High and little Rebecca High at their house in uh, 8th Street. And this is Herbert Highfield's house in the background on the west side of Dune Drive. Note the vehicle and the upgrade to the new vehicle. Now there's a dormer on the, on the front of the house, on the roof of the house. And now for the cemetery enthusiasts, we're over at the Methodist Cemetery on Route 47 in Goshen. This is Mal Malachi High, who apparently was in the Civil War. And there's the little marker, so I guess. And his wife, Sarah Oker High. And they're in the beginning of the, when you walk in the cemetery, they're kind of just to the right of the church, right in front of the parking lot. And then even right next to them right here is a big Townsend tombstone for the Townsends. Here's Amos and Emma. There's their resting place. And look at this. Born in 1862, died in 1966. And we'll discuss that. We're going to do a lot more discussing because I'm going way too fast. Now here's brother and sister. Here's Edna. When she was a fur tech now. And then here's her brother Herbert, the first boy born on the island. He was a private, second battalion, trench artillery, and I don't know what the CAC stands for, but he was in World War I and obviously survived. And then this was his wife, Anna. Oh, yeah, I'm going way too fast. Piermont resident dies in a snowdrift, Frank Furtek. He was returning from a hunting trip in Gloucester County. He's coming down Route 9, making the turn, the left turn onto Avalon Boulevard, and he got, where does it say? He ran into a snowbank after he turned the corner. So he got stuck in a snowbank. There was a, a restaurant on the corner by Mr. and Mrs. Jones, and they saw his crash into the snowbank. They saw him get out of the car, spread a blanket on the snow, and get down on the blanket as though it was the work on his car. Mr. Jones went out a short time later to see if he could aid Mr. Furtek and found him unconscious. So with a friend, he carried him into the restaurant and put a call out for the local doctor, uh, Millard Cryer. He was the county's physician. And he arrived later and pronounced Mr. Furtek dead. So he had a heart attack and died. Then we have Anna Highfield. Where did we go with her? And uh, she was born in Philadelphia. She survived by her husband, Herbert. That was Herbert's wife. They had their son, Herb Jr., was the lifeguard. And they had three daughters, Mrs. Bates, Mrs. Scobie, and Mrs. William Buck. 
Bill Buck was another local character on the island and, and, and an upstanding resident. And then this was just 2012. This was Dorothy Jane. She was a Herbert and Marie Fifty in Highfield, a lifetime resident. Gosh, I went way too fast. Okay, now this is where you want to take notes. Mrs. Emma Highfield has her 100th birthday. She's interviewed in the paper. Take notes. Would you like to live to be 100 years of age? She attributes her longevity to an unrestricted diet at ads. I eat anything and everything I choose. Her daily menu often includes sauerkraut or cabbage, her favorite foods. I love all foods except parsnips. Make a note of that. Uh, her favorite menu item is navy bean soup with bacon. And then at the very bottom, the last line, I could eat nails and it wouldn't bother me. So if you want to live to be above 100, don't eat parsnips, eat nails. Then over here, she dies at 103. She's the oldest resident in the whole county. She was born in Goshen to Malachi and Sarah High. Now this talks about the businesses that they had. They had their first store, and it's covered by me. They had their first store on 8th Street. In 1910, they had the store on the boardwalk by the Weintraubs on 32nd Street. In the 30s, they had a store on 21st Street, but only for three years, and that's talking all in here of that. And then in 1946, they had a, the confectionery store with her standing in front with the flowers, and that was a wool store. And then 1952, they moved to the boardwalk and the wool store. And I have to apologize. I just went through this way too fast because that's, I'm done. I don't know what to, to say about that. It only took, I thought it was going to take way more than a. Again. And here they are, the gang, again. Good. All right, I'm sorry I, did, I went through it too fast, Bill. No, it's that. That was good. That was good. I think runs, our programs run anywhere from 40 minutes to, to an hour, so it, that's you're right there. I was I wondering if you have one question here. I, actually, I have, uh, uh, I have um, uh, you know, um, I have one question, and I, I'm a little puzzled on it, so maybe the the questioner can uh, be a little bit more explicit. They're asking, did the slideshow need to move? And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. That was at the beginning, but that was when you had your first slide up and you did move the slides on. So maybe if they could be a little bit more elaborate on that, on, on that question, I'll be able to help answer mm -hmm. it for them. I do have a question, though, from someone. What, if anything, do you know about the dew drop in? Was it a bed and breakfast? Did they serve liquor? What, I guess that's what they're looking for. Yeah. And what I, happened to it? Like a boarding house or something or other? I'm, I'm not really sure. I just, the information was on the back of the picture. And again, two things I, I, I forgot to mention. If you go on the website for the Avalon History Center, there's a three-part series on the history of Avalon. And Bill did the first one on the early years. And that'll fill in a whole lot of information on the railroad, the first buildings. I didn't even mention the hotels. I forgot to mention the hotels, uh, the railroad, the leveling of the dunes, how the streets were all laid out. That is all in Bill's program. Then also maybe the information about the dew drop in would be in Bob Penrose's book on Avalon on the Seven Mile Island. Yeah. He mentions everything. I can see now why that book took him over 15 years to do it. He yeah. mentions everything. Uh, well, there's, there's so much about Avalon, you know, the homes, the churches, the how it got started, the train. There's just so much to try and put within a, you know, an hour presentation. It's pretty difficult. There's just, there's different aspects to it. And what you went into was just one family who was a significant family in Avalon, uh, being the first boy, boy born in Avalon, which is a, you know, and, and, and they, they were important back then. And so I think it's, you know, different uh, things, whether they be houses, people in Avalon or whatever, there's a lot of stories within Avalon. And uh, I think it's just great. Um, I, the, uh, let me see if I have another, 
I do have a little bit more information. I forgot the thing I forgot. That's why I brought this picture back up. Yeah. Here's again, this is 30, 32nd Street here and the Methodist Church. Over here, another two blocks was the Piermont Hotel. It was one of the two hotels on the island. The Piermont Hotel, and I have the information, I lost that somewhere, was only there for six years before it burned down. Yeah, 1889 to 1896. It was at 33rd and 34th Streets, right on the beach. So, where's my cursor? Right over here, another block, was a big Piermont Hotel. You want to see the, the, what that looked like and the information about that, go to Bill Mangle's uh, program on the early Avalon. Then the other picture, let me jump ahead. To, well, I guess, let me go to this, this one. This is 3rd Avenue and 8th Street. Two blocks to the east and to the north was the Avalon Hotel. So those were the two big hotels on the island. Uh, and that's, I guess, they were the center of things. So that's where these people kind of like settled and congregated. And I also mentioned one other little tidbit that I can throw in. That when I said that, uh, that uh, Malachi became like the dog catcher. Let me, let me quit jumping around. Let me get back to the beginning. When he became the dog catcher, there was uh, they were concerned. In fact, it was, I mean, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Sorry to, yeah, here. Mr. Von Weinberg, however you say his name, thank you so much. This was his boathouse. He became a commissioner in town, and he complained about the fact that everybody's animals were rolling around. Uh, chickens and a sheep possibly a cow or whatever because there's still cows on the island and so he decided we can't have these animals roaming around so they built a pen a pound for him and that's where he made malachi the uh in charge of the pound and collecting all the animals roaming around now when stone harbor got uh, incorporated in 1913 at the south end of the island one of the first ordinances they passed or i think it was ordinance number 17 was in Stone Harbor, from April until October, you weren't allowed to let your chickens roam around on the island. You had to keep them on your property. And if your chickens were caught roaming around, you got a $5 fine from the town. And the town was able to, as they put it right in the ordinance, they were able to spend that money any way they chose. So there was a little issue with, there was more animals on the island than people originally. And, uh, Okay, you said there was another question. Yeah, I have actually. I have. Uh, I have a comment, I guess, and I, I have a question uh, first. The the question I have. Uh, well, actually, let me just. I just sent a response to someone, and you had mentioned it a couple times, Bruce, several times in in your presentation. The book that uh, Bruce is talking about, the Bob Penrose book, which I call the Bible of Avalon, or refer yes. to as the Bible of Avalon. Yes. You can purchase that. The the questioner question where can you get that you can get that right here at the avalon history center and um you know it sells for 55 dollars. it's a thick hardback book but it's got just about anything you need to know about avalon excellent excellent book can't say enough about it as bruce has commented himself it's an so, encyclopedia. It, so i did answer the person and uh hopefully but if there's anyone else out there who's curious about that that's where you can purchase the book the second, this next question I have, Bruce, is can you elaborate more on Dr. S.L. Weintraub and her oh. Syrian heritage? To be a doctor, let me, to be a doctor in the 1890s and a foreign born woman is significant. Another reminder of the significance of the immigrants in the history of the U.S. But I don't know if you know any more about Dr. Weintraub. Yes, I do. They weren't immigrants. They were from Pennsylvania. It's just that their parents were missionaries and they were concerned about undeveloped countries. So they ended up being missionaries in Syria. They were very religious. And, uh, but she had a, because I guess of uh, the concern her parents had for other people, she wanted to see what she could do to help. And she was determined she wanted to go to a medical school. And she went to medical school and she impressed a few people enough that, uh, they put her in, in charge of the uh, women's prison. And uh, she was a head physician and apparently a brain surgeon, I was told. So this is her now. This is uh, 
Where's my thing on her? Sarah Louise was her name. This is, again, I'll introduce you. This is Sarah Louise. She was born in 1861, died in 1939. Um, I'm thinking this is Helen with the dark hair. 1870, she was born to 1930, and she was a stay-at-home foster mom. And then this is Georgine. She was a Philadelphia school teacher, born in 1876. And then we looked them up. They're, born, they're buried, it's a family plot, in Arlington Cemetery. And I'm like, wow, they're in Washington, D.C. They're that important? Well, no, it's this, the cemetery, it's Arlington Cemetery. It's in Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia somewhere. But uh, so it's, they have a family plot together. The women never married, and they really didn't have to because they always had a family. And even, and I just noticed, here's a little puppy right here. They always had dogs. There was a kitten or two, and there was always kids at their house. They were, they were, that's just the way they, they were brought up and it's the way they were. They were really a special family. Good. And so they weren't Syrian. Actually, they were German. Their, their grandparents were born in Germany. They were German, came to America, Philadelphia. They were American, but then their parents were missionaries and they went to Syria to try to help people there. And the, the daughters got the compassion from their parents and uh, that's where they were a foster mom, school teacher, and a, and a physician. Okay, I have a, a this is a comment, I'm, uh, and I'm not going to mention the person's last name, just so that it's, uh, read that anonymous. It, and I, I've never seen a spelling. I think it's, it's pronounced Kathy, K-A-T-H-I. I, you know, I guess that's how it's spelled. But anyway, Kathy is saying, uh, she wants to comment that she says she's, uh, she, I am from the Dowling line. When I was eight years old, I attended my Aunt Emma's 100th birthday party. She had received a birthday card from President Kennedy, and she was very proud of it. So there we go. There's a couple of pictures. I, because I thought this was going to take so long, and it didn't, it was going to take so long, there's a couple of pictures of her 100th birthday party with the family all gathered around her. So I didn't include that because I thought it would run too long. Now I'm sorry I didn't include it. So there were a couple of family photos that the mu the museum has of her uh, of her hundredth birthday party. Then uh, that what what did you say her name was? Callie, huh? Whatever uh, she's well, whose name? name? She she was from the Dowling line. D o w l i n g. Yeah, yeah. I saw a name. I saw a name. Yeah. She was eight years old and attended yeah, her yeah. and it was her 800th birthday. She's probably in the picture. I'm sorry, I, 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 I edited some pictures because I thought it would be too long. And so she could have, her picture would have probably been in this, in the, in this also because there's the 100th birthday picture. All right. Good. Well, that's all I have from here as far as questions, Bruce. Um, I want to thank you again. Uh, for coming out and presenting this. I think the photographs were excellent um, and the presentation also. I mean, it was very good, uh, very interesting. And uh, anything about Avalon is, is interesting. Yeah. Um, I, so uh, with that, uh, unless we have anything else, I don't have any other questions, but um, I just wanted to take a minute to mention what we have. We have a program uh, usually we have one a month or maybe one or two a month, whatever. We have one coming up next week, Friday, February the 13th, Valentine's Day Traditions. Very appropriate as the next day is Valentine. So I think it's something you may want to look at. Kevin Weiss, who is, will be back with us again. He has given a couple programs for the History Center, and he's going to cover Valentine's Day pretty much from the beginning. How the Valentine card came around, Cupid, the whole bit. So that'll be next Saturday, February 13th at one o'clock. Like to see you all back there. And again, those that this is your first time in, thank you so much for registering. And uh, also welcome, uh, welcome back to those who were, have been with us before and hope to see you again. Bruce, thanks again. Thank and, you, um, you know, uh, Bruce will probably be back later on uh, uh, down the road. Parry Tell will be doing, uh, you know, uh, his wife will be doing the program next month in March. I think it's March 6th. And um, so uh, stay tuned to check our website. 
and for all the upcoming programs. And again, thank you all. And if nothing else, stay safe today, okay? All right, take care, everyone. Ciao.